All right, chat. This is a very exciting uh, race for me because, um, all right, uh, because you know when I ran for a, a state legislature back in 2014, there was pretty much no one uh, like this uh, running. Um, so let's uh, let me uh, read some of Paul's biography here, uh, chat, and then you can introduce yourself, Paul, and then we'll we'll get right into it. Um, chat, Paul uh, is running for the 8th District here in Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania State Senate. He is a history teacher and a union activist. And um, he comes from an immigrant family. And the 8th District is located in uh, northern Philadelphia. And what I was really struck by is how you have integrated your political views with actual practice in real life, so-called praxis, is that during the pandemic, you have been committed to helping mobilize your community, uh, support essential workers, and do so through the Philadelphia DSA, which is about building these structures for the long term that are independent and persistent outside of one political candidate or one political campaign. So Paul, uh, what would you, uh, why don't you introduce yourself uh, to the audience and then, uh, explain some things that maybe I left out. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. And one small correction, the 8th District actually is mostly West Philadelphia. West Philadelphia? Um, okay. Yeah, and okay. also encompasses some parts of Delaware County as well, um, such gotcha. as like Lansdowne, Sharon Hill, Yaden. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's um, what you said about kind of the work I've done in the past. You know, I'll, I'll be honest, most of my work has not been in the realm of electoral politics. Um, so, you know, the labor movement is really near and dear to my heart. Um, that's kind of what I did, even as a student activist, was around student labor solidarity. Um, I've been a public school teacher for the last six years, I'm very active at my own union, the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers. Um, and, you know, my, a lot of my work in DSA has kind of been building that broad progressive labor alliance that we're always talking about. And I think trying to make that a reality mm -hmm. as much as possible. And I think in this race, you know, that is going to be the coalition that we need um to win we can't win with just self-identified leftists or dsa right. members you know <laughs> but we also can't win with with, with just labor alone um it's got to right. be both and i think that's kind of something about my background that i bring as a strength to that race is you know a lot of times in my history that's been the kind of coalition i've been working to build so why don't you explain to the chat the uh the situation as far as politically um are you challenging an incumbent? Is it an open seat? What is the, you know, uh, the ground as far as like political machine? How much right. labor support are you really going to get? Just because, you know, if you're, I know we all understand how Philadelphia politics works, right? And that right. is they tend to support their own rather than being about what you believe, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah, and so I'm in, I'm challenging a longtime incumbent named Anthony Hardy Williams, um, who kind of interesting history. His father was also a state senator by that same name, Anthony Hardy Williams. Um, <laughs> and my opponent, I mean, kind of inherited the seat from his father. Has never faced any kind of serious challenge in the primary. Um, he has tried to run for other offices, like he ran against uh, Jim Kenney for mayor. He's run for governor before. Um, and bo both of those races, um, he, he lost those races. Um, so I think this is a really interesting dynamic of, yes, this, this is a long time incumbent. Like this is not by any stretch of the imagination going to be an easy race, but it's also someone who's shown they, they have never proven they can actually win an election. Um, and I think, you know, in many ways has kind of taken the seat for granted. And a lot of people in the district uh, feel that. Um, but, you know, as far as labor goes, you know, and this is what is exciting about this, you know, as you, you probably know, and if listeners don't know, I mean, the unfortunate reality is often with labor, you know, they want to back the winner or who they mm -hmm. think will be the winner. Uh, and oftentimes that is an incumbent, or at least they don't want to take a risk of bucking an incumbent. Um, so even for someone like me and, and others who are, you know, have great labor, uh, have a great labor platform, it, it's not always an automatic that they're going to endorse someone like me. But so far, we actually have four union endorsements so far. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm actually, you know, expecting slash looking forward to um, some more in the near future. So those unions include um, um, Teamsters Local 623. They represent our UPS workers. Um, 
Teamsters, Brotherhood of Maintenance Way employees, they're railway maintenance workers. Um, and one thing that's exciting about that politically is, you know, a big part of what I want to focus on is around infrastructure in the state, and especially like, you know, green, uh, gr creating green union jobs. And like, you know, the railway maintenance workers, they would be involved in building out a high speed rail system, which I think we really need in this state and in this country. Um, yes, our, absolutely. Our, just our public transit in general is a big part of how we can fight uh, climate change. So they've endorsed, um, you know, the faculty at the Community College of Philadelphia, um, which is very near to my heart because, you know, as an institution that's serving mostly working class students, um, right. many who can't afford, uh, you know, other colleges that are really expensive. So many students I've taught and I take, teach high school, you know, they, they get their start at Community College of Philadelphia. Um, so they are backing me and that's definitely a value of mine is, is making our we, you know, the state actually needs to be funding our community colleges a lot more. Um, and that's a big part of how we keep tuition very low so students can afford to go there. Uh, but then also recently, my alma mater at Temple University, that their faculty union has endorsed me um, as well. Nice. Um, so, you know, these are four unions so far um, that are really bought in. And I think, you know, they're bought in not just beyond beyond just like giving money, which of course is important, but you know, they're really committed to mobilizing their members in this race as well. Uh, you know, to take an example, you know, Teams of 623, the two big UPS hubs in Philadelphia are in Southwest Philly. Um, and a lot of their members live in that part of the district. And so there, you know, we have a really close relationship um, that we've developed over the years of being there for each other. And, you know, they really want to mobilize their members in this race as well, not just, you know, put their name on, on a paper endorsement. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we have so far. And then, um, again, I'm hopeful for more. I'm, I'm obviously vying to get as many union endorsements as possible. Right. Um, and, you know, sometimes the dynamics of this, and I don't, I don't necessarily blame them for doing this. You know, people want to make sure this race is serious. So, you know, they might want to sit on the sidelines, wait to see that I know what I'm doing, that I can actually raise money, um, and, and things like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Before, uh, endorsing, but, um, so far the momentum is good. And I think, you know, the more unions endorse early on, I think that the more it convinces other unions to feel safer about taking this this kind of chance. But um, I think it kind of speaks to people are really hungry for some kind of change. And if they see a candidate, as far as labor goes, that really comes from labor and understands that world, um, you know, they feel that that's what they want to go with. You know, Paul, one of the things I'm, I'm uh, struck with is one of the major uh, uh, impediments to progressive change or in my view is the democratic party institutions itself and i think about your opponent uh who i know and um if i now correct me if i'm wrong isn't he a very strong supporter of charter schools and kind of very pro bank pro uh hedge fund isn't he wasn't he a major recipient of hedge fund money when he ran for governor like he got the largest donation single donation ever in pennsylvania history is that isn't that right yeah and you know <laughs> and to this day i mean one of his biggest supporters is a man named jeffrey yass y-a-s-s -S. people can look it up um big hedge fund billionaire guy there's also a few other people as well and these are his biggest financial backers and what's really concerning is you know these are people, they love him, not because he advances school privatization. as Exactly. Mentioned. And also, you know, a lot of these people, you can trace them back, you know, there's a straight line tracing them to the same PACs that supported Betsy DeVos. So these are the people that love my opponent. But even more disturbingly, these people also fund really far right-wing efforts in this state, including like Stop the Steal stuff. And so we really have to question why are, you know, even though my opponent is a Democrat, why are these far right, far, far right, billionaire funder so <laughs> interested in funding him for and again not just when he ran for governor but all the way into this day i mean you can if you look at the public finance report in, in quarter one you will see very big donations from these people and i'm sure they will continue to spend a lot of money to defeat someone like me you know um, it, it it's 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 not funny because um uh you know i actually helped to run a progressive uh, uh state senate campaign back in 2018 that came within 1% of, of winning in, in the general. And uh, I remember, you know, from my experience, it was always the biggest impediment was always the Democratic Party institutions. Um, 
And you're running in a seat that is a very safe Democrat. I think the last time he actually was challenged by a Republican, Anthony Williams got, I'm looking at, at it right now, he got 86% of the vote. Right. Um, and so this is about as true blue of a district as you could possibly get. And yet you have somebody who's allied with Betsy DeVos and hedge funds and wants to privatize our school systems. How do you account for that? And, you know, uh, you know, I'm not trying to get you on the wrong side of the Democratic Party, but the reality is you're you're challenging an incumbent. So right. you're going to until you beat them, um, they're going to be against you. <laughs> um, yeah, right. um, so how do you how do you wrestle with that? And as a D DSA member, what do you think about entryism into the Democratic Party uh, overall as a strategy? Yeah. These are big questions. Um, I mean, one I will say in this race, you know, it, it, it's complicated because, I mean, you have in the Philadelphia part of the district, the ward system. Um, and don't get me wrong, you know, there will be many wards. It will be, to say the least, an uphill battle to get the endorsement. But I also wouldn't write all of them off. Right. Um, and we've seen some interesting happens where, you know, a lot of progressives are actually getting themselves involved as committee people and ward leaders and actually starting to change some of these wards up and then you know in the delaware county <laughs> yeah in the delaware county part of the district um the structure is a little different where it's kind of like these uh democratic party clubs and, and councils right. and again i right. wouldn't you know some of them I'll, I'll say you know they have big issues with williams uh especially around school privatization um so i actually think it's possible it, it could be a mixed bag in the, the level of support i get um from the party but yeah and i think there's a very unfortunate feedback loop that goes on where it's like, okay, you know, no matter what you want to say about the Democrat, even if they're not great, but there, there's always the boogeyman of the Republicans that people are scared about. And there's always this pressure. So we need to close ranks just to defeat the scary Republicans. Even if, you know, I think you can make the argument that the fact that we keep settling for less with Democrats is part of why the Republicans can gain so much at the state and federal level. There's always that pressure. Um, but, you know, generally this idea of the left using the Democratic Party battle line, you know, I think it's definitely full of risks and, and contradictions. And we, we keep seeing repeatedly, whether you want to look at Bernie or whether you want to look at India Walton or um, Nina Turner, you know, the party coming out against the left uh, in different ways. I, I still think, and this is partly from the Bernie experience, like it, it, at the moment, it really seems to be our only option electorally is to use this ballot line um, mm -hmm. given the so many structural hurdles to creating a third party system. And I think what we saw with Bernie was just him using that ballot line, giving him the access to the audience of millions of people. Right. Obviously this is a national race, but like, you know, the audience of many voters who, you know, even though they're, they're rank and file Democrats, I think most of their values fall along the lines of some version of social democracy, at least I think for, for so many voters. Um, I think that remains our viable strategy for now. And I think the trick is like having, and this is what I I'm, I'm think I'm building. I, I'm hoping I'm, I'm building in this campaign is using that ballot line, but also having an infrastructure that is, that is independent of the party in some right. cases. Um, and part of, you know, for me, the unions are part of that infrastructure, the unions that are willing to back me. Also groups like DSA and, and other progressive groups, you know, at the end of the day, these are going to be the people uh, you know, in the volunteer game, knocking doors, you know, doing that kind of organizing. And again, it, I, I certainly am not going to like write off certain structures of the party that could be divided and some of them might lend resources. But I think the trick is having an infrastructure that is still independent of that if you're not getting that kind of help that you need. Um, and, you know, it, it varies across the country, but like we've seen even in recent years in Philadelphia, at the state level and the city level, um, a lot of progressives winning who, if I'm being honest, you know, I probably didn't expect to win, but, it <laughs> yeah. kind of, but also kind of shows this is like the, and it's, this is why I say it's a very like contradictory process, like the weird opportunities that might present itself when a democratic party is more hollowed out like it is today, where it's like, you know, the, the traditional structures and the wards, it's not that they're meaningless, but they have, they carry less weight than they used to. And if you, if you can have this volunteer army that is well-organized and a real infrastructure you can kind of pull off some surprising victories if you really have a plan. And that's what we've seen uh, in Philadelphia these last few years is, is some kind of surprising victories from 
people on the left um, that I, I'm hoping to kind of build on. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because uh, uh, I couldn't agree with you more because uh, I was uh, involved with a candidate kind of peripherally named Jabari Brisport, who's oh, now yeah. a state senator in right. uh, in New York City. And he initially ran, his first foray into electoral politics was a run as a Green Party member, where he, you know, he performed amazing. He got like 25% of the vote in the general election, which really good for a Green Party candidate. And then the very next election, he decided to try the entryism and then was part of the uh, movement that was key to defeating um, the uh, so-called independent caucus Democrats who were actually caucusing with Republicans and giving them yeah. power the, in the New York State Senate, uh, but getting but winning primaries as Democrats. So people thought they were voting for Democrats, but they were in fact voting to empower Republicans. So I think entryism makes a lot of sense. But there has been that new wrinkle, and you mentioned it, so I, I might as well ask if, uh, how concerned you guys are that if you were to win, that the senator would not concede, would launch a write-in campaign, and, you know, obviously you got to do the first thing first, and that's win the primary. But the second part is, you know, do you think that they might try that strategy uh, in, in Philadelphia? Yeah, you know, um, I don't think so. I mean, I'm partly saying that because at least from what I'm aware of, I haven't been seeing that happen at the state level. Um, that being said, I mean, I, I don't know, I guess I wouldn't put anything past anyone. Um, so yeah. yeah, at the moment, I, I don't think so. And we haven't seen that at least in the last few local state and city races in, in Philadelphia, at least. Um, but you know, and if it does happen, it really kind of goes back to, you know, it, it, if we win this election, we're going to win through our, our ground game and our organizing and, and talking to people. That's like, you know, we don't have, I mean, money is important, of course. And like, we are doing yeah. a good job with fundraising, but you know, we don't have access to the millions. My opponent will, we're going to win through people and organizing. And right. if it came down to a scenario like that, it's really going back to the, the same basis of how we would have won the primary of defeating that challenge, um, which is, you know, going back to the doors and, and talking to people. Um, but yeah, hopefully it, it doesn't come to that. Um, but you never know, I guess. Yeah, 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 no. And I, and I think, um, you know, I think your connections, uh, especially to, um, labor, you know, once you win the primary, there will, there, will, there might be a more of a tamp down than there was for India. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm, um, kind of heartened by, and you mentioned it, you know, a, a few times, which is the building of the left, you know, the socialist left and the progressive left within Philadelphia. Do you think that Philadelphia is entering a new phase of its politics where this kind of like leftist movement can become the predominant strain of politics in Philadelphia um, over the long run? How, you know, how do you see those battles going? And I know there's been a lot of exciting wins and, and some tough losses as well. And how do you see Philadelphia itself uh, kind of progressing uh, within the climate that we have of, you know, a Democratic Party, you know, yeah. civil war? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're seeing encouraging signs. And I think part of what is encouraging is you're seeing that some power players, I mean, whether they're individuals or unions or organizations like that are very just pragmatic in their thinking are starting to see the coalition's changing in real time and actually starting to see like the left, it can really win be and because we're just seeing it repeatedly in recent right. history that they're able to win and that's changing the calculation. I think that's the biggest sign of growing strength of the left is that, you know, people that are, are backing the left for pragmatic reasons, not just on uh, principle. Um, so we're seeing that, but, you know, I think it's always like, um, I mean, it's always in danger of unraveling, at least to me. So I think we need to keep, consolidating our wins and i think with my race like i would be what's exciting is that if i win i'd be joining kind of a growing block right. almost like a mini squad at the state level that we've been developing in the state house and the state senate but i do think if we're going to get anywhere we need to keep adding to that block and consolidating our strength um and again i think building up more campaigns that have labor support from the beginning which again is something i'm just excited with my campaign that we're showing is that you can get labor on board from the ground floor in a, in a campaign that, you know, traditionally they might look at as kind of risky. And so I think like continuing to grow that and maybe trust between the labor movement and the left is, is going to be important. Um, but yeah, I think there's always a danger. It can be 
unraveled. So, um, but it, you know, we, we're, we're seeing like pretty encouraging signs so far. And I think also the trick and another thing that's interesting about my district is that it overlaps with the surrounding county and some of the suburbs. And I right. think taking this strength out to where we, we also need to be competitive in the suburbs and in rural areas is kind of like the next frontier that we need to, to get to as elect. You know, um, I'm struck by, we're kind of like beating around the bush, which is that basically the Democratic Party and, and organized labor have been in a defensive posture in Pennsylvania for a long time. And, um, you know, just last this past week, we covered the fact that the Teamsters had a major national election and they yeah. elected what was the reform slate, the so-called militant slate. Uh, they, you know, turned out the Hoffas um, mm -hmm. for the first time in decades. And, you know, do you think that this is kind of like a symbiotic development that we're going to see, which is like some, you know, we get more progressive and militant and unions willing to take more risks in order to win something for a change and grow as opposed to, you know, managing the decline that we've kind of seen as the organized labor strategy in Pennsylvania for 15 years. Yeah. And actually that's something I forgot to mention in my last answer is that, you know, there's also, like I kind of mentioned before, there's some new blood in the local labor movement, like new leaderships that are winning office. And, and again, I think these are people not just willing to do a different thing in their own union, but even electorally. And so like going back to that Teamsters UPS local, they're a great example. I mean, they're one of my closest allies. Um, and they, you know, they recently got a new reform leadership that won office, I think about two or three years ago. And, you know, the, the reason our relationship is so close is that we were working closely together before that leadership was even in power and before right. I was even thinking of running for office. But, you know, I, I, I would say like, you know, it, if that change in leadership didn't happen, I don't think I'd have much chance with the older leadership of getting the endorsement. The endorsement. Right. And, and again, there's some other unions locally that, I'm, you know, cautiously optimistic in the near future um, could come on board in, in this campaign where it's a similar deal, where it's this relatively new leadership that they're not just going to play ball in the old way. And I think there's this hunger, and this is kind of part of what I'm saying to labor is like, we're at this stage, like it's not enough to just have a, a Democratic candidate who will just say, well, I won't overtly attack labor. Exactly. Like, like we need someone that is really actively proactive. And like part of what I, honestly, what I'm going to look forward to as a legislator is, you know, Yes, we might still have a Republican-dominated legislator, even, even if I win. Yes, it might be hard to get legislation through, but let's say there's a strike in my district. You know, a state senator can really, if they want to, uh, tip the scales in favor of the workers and unions if they really wanted to. You know, how much are you going to actually make this a public issue? Like, are you actually going to use your office and your resources to pressure the company to settle right. for the workers or to encourage workers or even organize your constituency constituents to support the strike again this is something you know you, you can do that if you want to do it and i think more candidates who kind of see their role in office is like it's not just about the legislation but like i'm going to do everything in my power to help grow the labor movement and i think more people kind of from labor understand the need for that you know again it's not just about i won't vote for the worst bills for labor but like what are you doing <laughs> Proactively, and honestly, I, I see this also as a big issue with, uh, you know, thinking about the building trades and transition to renewable energy, um, because right. increasingly many building trades leaders, like they recognize that like a transition is coming, whether they kind of want it or not. And I think right now it's a matter of we need to be proactive. And I, I'm saying we as legislators as well, like, you know, proactive to make sure like if we're going to transition to renewable energy as we should, making sure we're doing it with union labor and not creating just more low wage jobs. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think it's important to have a legislator that's going to be very proactive about that. Um, so we can kind of get out in front of this and, and, you know, as opposed to kind of letting it destroy union labor um, in the process. So um, yeah, I think you're kind of seeing these, like I'm hoping some transitions in how labor is thinking about electoral politics and like, you know, we need to elect people who are really, overtly pro-labor in, in every sense of the word, not just like not as bad as a Republican might be. Well, I mean, and your opponent is, you know, 
kind of as bad as a Republican would, you know, on, on a lot of these issues, because in particular, like, you know, the teachers unions are the strongest supporters of the Democratic Party in Pennsylvania state politics, you know, from, you know, boots on the ground to financial resources, they're, they're at the tippy top. And so to have a, a, a Democrat in such a safe seat, who is advancing anti-teacher union, anti-public um, you know, uh, public school policies, that's extremely damaging um, right. because, you know, that gets, that'll help legislation get over the finish line, you know? Um, right. You know, public school, you know, the teachers union sometimes has the ability to get friendly people on the other side, even in certain, certain districts to block things. And when you have, a Democrat who's there um, in a safe blue seat working against it, that seems wildly, it seems like political malpractice, you know, to me that he's right. even allowed to remain in office without constant challenges. It's striking to me that he just doesn't get challenged for t having such a far right opinion. Right. Um, that's odd. I wonder why that is. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> and I think this is the challenge. And like, I mean, I think part of it is just like, it's hard if you are within the establishment and you see your career as a politician, it's just like climbing that ladder. You, it's hard to take that risk of doing that with someone who has seniority and they can affect your career in numerous ways. And I think that's, we haven't seen someone challenge him before because like anyone that would have done it might've been within the establishment, but you know, right. So like they're very D, careerist who, opportunists who see politics right. through the individualist lens versus uh, representing right. a movement that could hold them accountable. Right. But yeah, but now it's like, you know, someone like me, like, I, I mean, I guess you could say I'm an outsider. I don't want, I don't even like to use the word outsider because it makes it seem like I have been very engaged in politics mm -hmm. in a different way, you know, again, primarily through the labor movement and for public education. But, you know, it's not like anyone can hold any patronage over me uh, to stop me from, from doing this. Um, but I think for so long, you know, these are decades where, you know, for so long and it was not normal for a leftist to, be engaged in electoral politics. Right. This is a phenomenon we're seeing really in the last five or six years. So I think for so long, it was just no one would risk their career to do something like this. Um, so, but we're, we're in a different moment now. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about some of those, you know, uh, issues that you are, are near and dear to your heart. So, um, oh, whoops, sorry about that chat. Um, you, um, I, you know, just looking at your, at your website, you talk about Medicare for all and healthcare, um, at, as a right. So for Philadelphians and, and people in Delaware County and Pennsylvania's as a whole, do you think that a, a universal single payer system is feasible in Pennsylvania? And can you talk more generally about that movement and building it up in, in Pennsylvania? Yeah, I mean, I do think ultimately Medicare for all should be a federal program. Um, it passed at the congressional level. Now, having said that, I do think it is feasible in, in states to move towards that. Now, it would require, I think, a dramatic change in, in our revenue situation. I mean, to, to fund it like this is true. Um, but I do think like the way also we can get to that federal bill is building up support through the states. Um, you know, and I think generally, and this kind of runs throughout my campaign, which is really just about public investment is like the need to make huge revenue changes at the state level. I mean, in this state, we leave so much revenue on the table. I mean, whether it's the fact that our natural gas companies, which have been experiencing a boom for the last two decades, don't pay taxes to the state. <laughs> no severance tax. Right. Texas has Delaware, it. Right. Or <laughs> the, Delaware loop, the Delaware loophole. I mean, companies just setting up fake headquarters in Delaware to get out of paying taxes. Um, you know, it just goes on and on, you know, and especially now, I mean, we've seen since COVID, like companies and individuals, the, the wealthiest companies and individuals in the state have just like made out like bandits since COVID began. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Comcast made a, a profit of $25 billion in one quarter of 2020 alone. Um, wow. our, we have like 12 or 13 billionaires in Pennsylvania. Their net worth has grown by around $13 billion since COVID began. So it's just massive amounts of wealth that we need to go after and tax to fund so many things I'm talking about. And I think if we were to do that kind of thing, that's where we could build towards a statewide 
single payer uh, program. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I, I will concede that that is a tough road through the state. Again, I think ultimately it should be a federal program. But I do think like, again, the more we can build up support for single payer healthcare in the state, mm-hmm. uh, whether that's in the form of state officials endorsing it and campaigning on it, or and then using that leverage to kind of progress uh, to pressure congressional uh, leaders on it. You know, I think the more we build that movement at the state level, even if we don't win statewide single payer health care, I think that's a big part of how we get to it at the federal level, if that makes sense. Um, yes. And, you know, one reason this issue is big for me, I mean, b- besides the obvious point that everyone deserves health care, I mean, I really see this as a big labor issue. I mean, I can't tell you and it's only getting worse. Uh, I mean, how many union negotiators and leaders will tell you health care has become the most the biggest sticking point in negotiations and often they're sacrificing wage increases so that they can get better health care um, and if you were to take health care off the bargaining table it would allow unions to focus a lot more on wages or workplace health and safety or working conditions you know health care and it's only just getting harder to maintain good health care benefits at the negotiating table so i really see it also as a, as a labor issue not just a health care issue all right. Um, yeah, that, that sounds um, like something that we should definitely be pursuing from my point of view. And, you know, uh, just to remind my community, that was the, you know, they did it at the provincial level in Canada. Their path to single payer health care was to demonstrate it at, at the provincial level, the, you know, this basically the equivalent to the state level. And then it became adopted nationwide. And now no Canadian would ever dream of going back uh, to the American system. And it's a constant, it's a source of national pride. Right. And so, yeah, you know, I also uh, say that even, you know, there's also a lot of stuff, even short of single payer that we can and should be doing, whether that's, you know, funding Medicaid more, um, having a better paid family uh, medical leave act. Um, Mm -hmm. There's also some legislation I'm really, passionate about that a lot of nurses unions are pushing around safe staffing ratios in hospitals, Mm -hmm. um, things like that, you know, and so all those things are kind of, they're not as big as single payer healthcare, but I think on the path there are things that we could definitely win and should be fighting for at the state level. So I want to ask you about municipal policy, because this is something near and dear to my heart. And um, what do you think about uh, the proliferation of TIFs? in Pennsylvania and, you know, and, and, and city development, you know, special taxing authorities, you have, you know, these opportunity zones and also the fact that so much of Pennsylvania's economic, you know, activity is in the form of tax free, you know, like, or nonprofit hospitals (laughs) and universities who use a tremendous amount of public services, but then avoid paying their share of taxes. And do you have any solutions to these problems? Yeah, I mean, it it really is a, just a failed model of development. And like, we really have to just just go on a different path from this. I mean, take, a, you know, you just kind of mentioned these mega nonprofits. I mean, a huge issue I always talk about is take the University of Pennsylvania, which has an endowment of over $14 billion. And yes, billion, not million dollars. And someone even just recently told me they actually think it's more accurately around $20 billion. So the University of Penn is designated a mega nonprofit and they do not pay property taxes. And so even a modest property tax on that endowment, and this is, you know, this is money that our schools are just straight up just losing out on. Um, so like we can't allow an institution worth over $14 billion to not pay property taxes. Um, that's just you know, the money they have saved in investments, you know, the endowment, you know, right. so that's, that's cash basically, you know, highly liquid investments that they have. So yeah, right. that's, that's a lot of money for a university to have yeah. uh, saved for a rainy day. Right. And, you know, and it's amazing that it's funny, this has been going on for decades and this is like the, the mainstream of the democratic party, their only vision of a development, the only thing they have in their <laughs> imagination is tax breaks. And which, they, yeah, which every, is what TIFs are, basically, you right. know. TIFs and, and opportunity zones, and they, every five to 10 years, they come up with a different name for it, but it's the same crap and in different form. And, you know, it, and, and we just reached this point, we have to acknowledge what is failing. I mean, we have made so many communities in Philadelphia, including in my district, where 
you could take a picture of it in 1980 and take a picture of it now, and it looks just the same or worse in terms of the, the clear disinvestment, the right. you know, damaged infrastructure, poor housing. So it's, it's just very clear that I don't understand where people are getting this idea. Well, if we do one more tax break, that is going to <laughs> solve our problems. And like, it's just very clear we need investment. And it's frustrating because, you know, the common question for someone like me, anyone on the left is always, how are you going to pay for it? It's right. always, and you know, I actually don't mind that question because I think we have an answer. And that part of that is we need to, to tax the wealthiest, you know, uh, corporations and, and individuals. And again, this is just low hanging fruit revenue that's on the table. But I think we got to get out of this model of just begging companies, doing anything we want to get them to come. And again, we really have to think about it. I mean, if a company's here not paying taxes and they have 40 jobs, okay, that's cool, but it's like, and they're not giving anything back to the community in terms of an investment or revenue, are we really benefiting from that? And it's, I think it's clear that, that we're not. And the, the revenue situation just keeps, uh, keeps getting worse. Um, so I guess that's a long way of saying that we have to get over this model. And, and again, this has been the dominant idea about development in through yeah party. yeah so you know it hasn't changed it's yeah amazing. paul it's, it's funny because you know i am one of these you know uh policy wonks from the left which is a rarity online at yeah. least and um one of my passions is i hate tiffs and right. i i think you know um this is like the quintessential neoliberal democratic politician move which is you have the taxpayer pay for development and then yeah. you get this corporation come in and then they use services, but they don't pay for them. And so you need right. to raise taxes on everyone else, which is the non-connected poor people. <laughs> so you have, right. you know, people in Philadelphia paying higher property taxes than people in the suburbs with property that's worth half as much. Why would right. you, of course, that's going to cause a cascade of disinvestment, right? Um, right? And would you think that that's important that, you know, if you were a leftist communicator or, or a leftist organizer or a leftist politician, do you think people should really dive into stuff like TIFFs or, or Opportunity Zones? Is that something that we should care about as leftists? Because a lot of leftists hear, you know, that kind of stuff and their eyes glaze over that that's, you know, wonk stuff. Yeah. No, I think we need to, you know, and I'll, obviously the challenge is being able to communicate it in a way that's clear and, and not too wonky and in the weeds for people who don't follow all, all the wonky details. But, but I also think it's important because like we can't be outflanked on the question of jobs because I think right. for many regular people, when it comes down to it, you know, if, if they're able to hear an argument that's like, well, we need to do these tax breaks because of jobs and we on the left don't have an alternative for how we create good paying jobs. And like, I don't think, you know, we can't be just like, blanketly anti-development. I, right. I don't think that, you know, it's not that we don't want development, but we want it in a way that's benefiting that the majority. Work. <laughs> right, yeah. And so I think, and I think this question of jobs can become tricky because it's like, you know, it, for some people, it's just a very pragmatic thing. Well, like, if we don't do the tax break, we won't get the jobs. Like, we have to have an answer to that. But, but also, this is kind of part of countering the whole neoliberal logic because ultimately, we have to arrive at a point where we're saying as a state, whether it's a state government and obviously the federal level, you have more resources to say, look, if the private sector is not going to step in for a certain kind of development. We're saying the state can and should do that. Um, and again, this is countering 50 years of logic, right? Yes. And, well, and part of, yeah. and part of yeah. the problem, too, as I'm, I'm sure you know, is that, the, and this is what's so insidious about neoliberalism, is like, as they hollow out the state, it actually becomes less realistic for the state to do these things right. unless you reinvest in the state. So I, you know, and, and so I understand people might hear what I just said and say, well, good luck getting the state to do development. Um, but ultimately, <laughs> ridiculous. yeah, I mean, ultimately we, we, I mean, we have to get to that point. I mean, I mean, what better example? And I know yes, the new deal of the thirties had its flaws. I'm not saying we just recreate it exactly, but right. like ultimately got to that point where it's like, okay, the private sector is not, you know, building infrastructure, it is not doing development, the state will step in. And my understanding, I'm not an expert in this history, but some of the New Deal programs actually got piloted at the state level, mm -hmm. and were kind of proven to be successful. And I think that's what I kind of want to do in Pennsylvania is, is kind of show that the state can take the lead on development, whether that's green infrastructure or uh, whatever it is, um, and counter this model that the only thing we can hope for is a tax break 
to spur development. Um, we, yeah. We've got to be willing to counter that in a clear way. You know, you know, some of the historical uh, examples I like to bring up, and I'm sure you heard them, Paul, but uh, I like to repeat myself from my community, which is so they learn, which is, yeah. you know, in Milwaukee, they had the sewer socialist movement, you know, mm -hmm. um, where right. that was uh, 30s, 40s. They had 30 years of socialist mayors because people saw how successful exactly what you're talking about was. They built public right. housing, public parks. They were called sewer socialists because they had the best public water systems yeah. and sewer systems. And we're now coming to that point where that's not a guarantee anymore. You yeah. know, you know, in Philadelphia, in Newark, in Flint, people don't have clean, fresh water. They go, yep. they send their children to schools where, you know, there's asbestos, there's pollution, it is physically dangerous. Right. And so, you know, having those examples, you know, as far as housing, it's a crisis everywhere. But, you know, uh, I just recently visited Vienna and uh, they have 60% of their population lives in social housing or co-ops, right. you know? So the housing and, that's like very beautiful and exactly. You know, yeah. And the average rent is $500 a month, you know, and this is one of the night it's, you know, one of the most livable cities in the world. And how do they do it? Well, they are determined to invest in housing as a human right. And they make it so that middle income people want to live in it. You know, it's not right. shameful. It's not, it's not under maintained. It's beautiful, modern housing and people want to live in it. And that's the only solution is actually recommitting to having big, bold ideas. Um, you mentioned earlier, and in that vein, you mentioned earlier, high speed rail, you know, yesterday, it's funny before you came on, I talked about how China built basically 25,000 miles of high speed rail since 2008. Yeah. Um, and so it's possible, you know, yeah. uh, I mean, we can do yeah. this. Yeah. And, and again, I mean, and just yeah. to hammer this point home, I mean, and this is what's so frustrating is that when, you know, when I just talked about all these fantastically wealthy corporations that either don't pay taxes or pay too low taxes or get around paying taxes through the Delaware tax loophole. I mean, if we literally just had a very modest tax, <laughs> If we just very modestly raise taxes on some of these mega wealthy institutions, that alone, I mean, the amount of revenue we'd have to start doing some of, of this stuff, let alone taxing them what they actually should be. But I'm just even, even modest improvements. There, it, it really is, there's a lot we can do with that money. And it's really, it's just like, you can't overstate how much revenue we just leave on the table um, in this state, in this country, of course. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just like amazing. You know, I, I often will go to Chicago, uh, different parts of the country, and I will like really want to try and take the train, right? Um, <laughs> no. Or other parts of Pennsylvania. And it's like, well, I can't do that unless I'm, it's like a 30 hour trip and annoying and, and expensive and all this sort of thing. Um, and meanwhile, you know, you can go all throughout Europe on high speed rail. That's really great. Um, but these are the things we got to be thinking about doing. And we totally, we have the technology to do it. The United States is a fantastically resource rich country. You know, there's just no reason we can't do it. And again, these are issues. I mean, what I love about issues of like public transit, for example, is we tick so many boxes at once. So public transit is quality of life, of course. It's also a climate change issue. It's also about creating really good paying union jobs in the process. And I think these are the issues that can build the biggest, broadest coalition of working people as possible that we'll need. Um, you know, to, to win these things and also to have a sustainable coalition. So that's kind of the issues I love to, to talk about the most, because like, it's really just w covering so many issues at, at one time. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, extremely important. And, um, you know, one, uh, Paul, is there any issues that we haven't touched on? Or do you have anything that you want to plug for my community to, to support your, your efforts? Yeah, well, I mean, one issue, you know, I think, uh, I mean, there's like a million things we could talk about, right? But uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, you know, there, there's public education, of course. And I mean, this is another thing I want to mention. And, and this is something I'm excited about because um, increasingly building trades unions are very supportive of this idea of, you know, it, we could retrofit and renovate every public school in the state to not only just, first of all, make it a livable building. I mean, so we have huge issues in the city and the state around. I mean, the average age of our school buildings is like 75, 80 years old. Um, mold, asbestos, lead, 
I mean, all the worst things you could think of. So not just renovating the buildings because they need to be renovated, but making them energy efficient as well. So that includes, you know, sheet metal workers retrofitting the building, putting solar panels on that. I mean, just think about how many jobs that could create a loan of doing that in public schools mm -hmm. across the state. That's a big issue I talk about. And again, we're seeing some movement where the building trades are very on board with it because it doesn't involve anyone having to lose a job or anything like that. So I kind of just want to highlight that when we're talking about education, because I think that covers environment and infrastructure as well. Um, but I think the other thing, and this is kind of an issue the left, I think has to get better at talking about broadly is like this issue of gun violence. Um, I know this could bring up many controversial topics, but like, you know, it's a huge issue in the district that I right. hope to represent and nationally. And it's one of these things where I think sometimes the left will get in trouble by trying to like, obviously we don't want to be promoting, you know, mass incarceration or obviously the solution to the issues of crime is not just more cops and all this sort of thing. But at the same time, it, it comes off as out of touch to like deny that there is a real violent crime wave happening. I mean, you just can't, and especially the people living in it, disproportionately working class black people, understand this. And I think the left has to get better at kind of just saying like, yeah, this is an issue and coming with real um, solutions around it. And I think, you know, this is kind of why I talk about public investment a lot. As I've started to knock doors in the district, you know, people really understand when I tell them, you know, I've taught at many schools where there's like no after school program, there's no funding. And, you know, that in itself is not going to solve the gun violence crisis. But like, if more youth had all the after school programs you could dream of, um, that I think would cut down on people getting in trouble, getting involved in other things. Um, you know, if we had much more good paying jobs that would help as well. So I think like, you know, we shouldn't be afraid to talk about gun violence and acknowledge that it's real, but just, you know, I think the, 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 the framework of public investment kind of helps to, to frame that for people. Um, mm -hmm. so just mentioning that, cause you know, that is one of the first issues that people bring up on the doors. Like there's really no ignoring it and it's very visceral for people especially in this moment all right paul well thanks thanks for coming on i, I really yeah. appreciate that um i'm gonna do the shilling for you because oh, uh, yeah. the one forgot, the one but... the one thing you you know as someone who ran for state ledge and has helped many of people run for it and win and lose <laughs> uh <laughs> the one thing that you have to remember chad is always be asking for action items so here's some of the things that you yeah. can do chat no matter where you are in the country the united states you can donate an unlimited amount of money to paul right. here and i'm putting his act blue into the chat right now you can support so pennsylvania we don't have any of those campaign finance limits okay <laughs> we believe in freedom right. <laughs> all right um right. uh so go ahead and and throw some money to paul of course follow him on twitter um and uh you know get involved yeah, i can't overstate how important the money is i mean it's unfortunate but again i'm gonna get up against someone where billionaires are going to shower him with money so anything you can give will be appreciated um you know this the, you can't do campaigns without money and uh, part of it too is you know i can't be a hypocrite and then talk about union rights and then pay my staff crap so a lot of this is really investing in my people and the staff so we can do what we need to do but um so please donate if you have you know what whatever you can give yeah and uh, and of course people power is very important so if you're in you know southeast eastern pennsylvania you know in the jersey suburbs you know you're you're one of those people south jersey who says you're from philadelphia well then go help your local dsa candidate um so you know knock some doors if you don't have a ton of money you can you know put some shoe leather on the ground so those are some things that you all can do. And if, you, if you're in California, you can probably sign up for phone banks eventually. You know, I don't know right. if you're doing and, them yet, but. Um, yeah, and, and just so people know, on the website, paulpresca.com, there's a get involved tab. And then so one of them will be a volunteer form. So if you fill that out, you'll get email updates on whether it's door knocking or phone banking, uh, whatever stuff you have coming up in the future. Yeah, that sounds great. And Paul, if you ever if you ever want to uh, pick my brain or or talk again, just uh, hit me up, and uh, I'd be happy to help. I'm very excited uh, for your race. This is a very necessary campaign. I commend you for having the courage um, to run into this buzzsaw, <laughs> and uh, I think you're going to be tough. I think you might be able to make it out the other side. Um, yeah, you got a yeah, real I'd love shot. To talk, talk more tips sometime. I, <laughs> talk I, I more about tips. 
need to learn more about it. So. <laughs> we, I mean, you know, listen, Paul, you're off, you're off on the right track, you know, uh, opportunity yeah. zones, tax breaks, uh, you know, uh, if it worked, then Pennsylvania would be a glorious golden, you know, shining example of development, uh, instead of losing population. Right. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Paul for coming on and, uh, Again, one more time, just spam the links, and I hope you have a wonderful day, and good luck. All right. Thanks so much for having me. Yep. Bye-bye.